Historians like to remind us that our founding fathers didn't like democracy. Our second president, John Adams, once said, quote, Democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There was never democracy yet that did not commit suicide. Our fourth president, James Madison, wrote, quote, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property and have, in general, been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Now, these men believed in natural rights. They believed that God had created mankind and that, therefore, human beings were entitled to certain inalienable rights. But as you can tell from these quotes, they didn't think that democracies were the best way to secure those rights. They believed that democracies were violent, chaotic, and that they tended towards anarchy. And most of the world seemed to agree. At the time, the vast majority of governments were monarchies, and most people believed that a strong central government was needed to keep the fabric of society together. George Washington believed that chaos or anarchy, quote, gradually inclined the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual, unquote. In other words, democracy tends to anarchy, but then swings back towards tyranny. But the founders also believed that monarchies led to tyranny. After all, this was the entire premise of the American Revolution. So if both democracy and monarchy led to tyranny, what was the solution? What was the best system that would ensure the inalienable rights of man? The founders believed they found a solution by instituting a republic, or a representative democracy. The people would have their say, yes, to elect their local officials and members of the House of Representatives. But that was as close to a pure democracy as they would get. The founders created filters. The people didn't get to choose their senators. The state legislatures did that. The people didn't get to choose their president. They voted for members of an electoral college to do that. The founders wanted the people to have their say, but they also wanted representatives to filter that choice, to temper what the Declaration referred to as, quote, light and transient causes. This is because they knew that the people, though entitled to their rights, were also fallible and needed to be checked. The founders studied history and knew that the people were liable to be misled by demagogues, by misinformation, and by self-interest. Well, the system worked very well for a while, but eventually we got rid of several of these filters. In the era of Jacksonian democracy, suffrage was expanded to a broader swath of the electorate, and many of those filters were removed. The Electoral College became a rubber stamp. Instead of being an independent group of voters, they more or less reflected the direct will of the voters in the states. The country as a whole became far more democratic than the founders intended. Now I say all that to set the scene for a specific event in American history. It was an event that showcased just how messy and chaotic democracy can be. In many ways, it confirms some of the Founders' worst fears, but it also testified to the strength of the system they created. That event was the presidential election of 1876, and it is the topic of this episode of This American President. So in 1876, something happened that many thought was impossible. The world's first large-scale republic, the United States, celebrated its 100th birthday. You have to remember, at this time, Europe, the dominant global power, still consisted mostly of kingdoms and empires. The United States stood alone as a large representative democracy, and it was doing well. The nation's economy was booming and rivaled the greatest European powers. But like Europe, it had experienced its share of violent conflict. The American experiment had successfully survived its first hundred years, and while it was proud of this achievement, one that monarchists thought impossible, it was also a bit bruised. In just the previous decade, its northern and southern states fought in what has been called the Civil War, resulting in the deaths of 600,000 American citizens, still the bloodiest war in its history. And while that war ended with the nation's reunification by force, the wounds of that cataclysm were still fresh. And the country in 1876 was in a state of discontent. 
In office was President Ulysses S. Grant, a Republican. As we all know, he was the victorious general of the Union Army during the Civil War. He had been elected in 1868 and re-elected in 1872 and was nearing the end of his presidency. Unfortunately, things weren't going so well. His administration was marred by one scandal after another. And those scandals had some pretty colorful names. The Credit Mobilier Scandal, the Whiskey Ring, the Gold Ring, the Delano Affair. The list goes on and on. Now, historians concede that Grant wasn't directly involved, but he clearly wasn't doing something right with all this happening. Things got so bad that a new term entered the political lexicon, Grantism, which was synonymous for fraud, graft, cronyism, nepotism, pretty much any form of political corruption known to man. So you know things are bad when your name becomes synonymous with what was wrong with the country. Even worse, a major national depression began in 1873, and that led to the failure of over 100 railroads and almost 20,000 businesses. Millions of Americans were losing their livelihoods, and confidence in the nation's leadership was at a low point. Now in the South, things were especially complicated. This was the era known to us as Reconstruction, when the nation was reconstructing itself in the wake of the Civil War. Resentment still simmered, and a ton of issues remained unresolved. The biggest issue involved the fate of four million former slaves, the vast majority of which had been liberated as a result of the war. While the 13th Amendment had ended slavery, black America's social, political, and economic situation remained at best uncertain and at worst dire in a white-dominated society. The federal government, led mainly by radical Republicans, had taken over the southern states, declared martial law, and force those states to accept amendments guaranteeing African-American suffrage and citizenship rights. But many Southerners resisted all this, and the Southern states enacted the infamous Black Codes, which relegated African-Americans to a status that wasn't all that different from slavery. Groups like the Ku Klux Klan unleashed violence throughout the South to disrupt the occupation and to maintain the status quo. And before long, riots broke out between blacks and whites, particularly in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Mississippi. Now, the Democratic Party had been out of the White House for two decades, but it was making a comeback, mainly in the South. It appealed to the Southern voters by attacking what they saw as the federal government's heavy-handed occupation of the South. And this was when the term carpetbagger entered the political debate. These governments were seen as oppressive and corrupt. They were seen as carpetbagging governments. And with Grantism festering in the nation's capital, the message resonated, and some Democrats even reached out to African Americans with limited success. So as a result, the Democrats began winning elections and taking over the governments of the southern states. In the midterm elections of 1874, the Democrats made massive gains. They won 93 seats in the House and 9 seats in the Senate. And for the first time in decades, Republicans were now facing strong Democratic opposition. And the Republicans in the North started rethinking this whole Reconstruction thing. The governments they installed were ineffective and unpopular, and it cost money to keep military forces there. Compounding all of this was the fact that the country was in the midst of a depression. So with all of these problems, the political will behind the occupation started waning. So before long, federal forces were leaving the southern states but they would remain in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, since violence was still occurring in those states. So by 1876, the Democrats were the dominant political force in the South. And that year, the nation's centennial also happened to be a presidential election year. The Democrats hadn't won the White House since 1856. They were sick of losing and were looking to end their 20-year losing streak. And it was in this situation where both parties gathered to select their presidential nominees. When the Democrats began their convention in Cincinnati, Ohio, in June of 1876, they had several candidates to choose from. Maine Congressman James G. Blaine, who had served as Speaker of the House, was the frontrunner. New York Senator Roscoe Conklin was another option. The problem was that Blaine was tainted by his involvement in shady railroad investments, and Conklin was a machine politician who was part of the corrupt party establishment. In the era of Grantism, being part of the establishment was not a good thing. People wanted someone fresh, someone new. So the party ended up settling on a dark horse candidate, 
Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, history tends to view Hayes, who was 53 years old at the time, as a friendly but bland fellow, and in many ways this was accurate. But at the time, he had a reputation for competence and integrity. Hayes had served in Congress and was in his second term as the governor of Ohio. He had supported the radical Republicans during Reconstruction and suffrage for African Americans. But he was also tough. During the Civil War, he had rose to the rank of Brevet Major General. He saw combat 50 times and was even wounded four times. As I read about Hayes, I pictured a pretty straightforward guy with a great deal of confidence. Case in point, when he was thinking about running for the presidency, he wrote in his diary, quote, It seems to me that the judgment, experience, and firmness I possess would enable me to execute the duties of the office well. I do not feel the least fear that I should fail. This all looks egotistical, but it is sincere, unquote. And it also helped that the convention took place in Ohio, his home state. So later that month, the Democrats convened in St. Louis, Missouri to nominate their candidate. And unlike the Republican convention, the party was unified behind one choice, New York Governor Samuel J. Tilden. Now Tilden, who was 62 years old, wasn't a Civil War veteran, but he was no lightweight. He was renowned for his brilliant legal and business career. He had been a protege of former President Martin Van Buren, and had made a fortune on Wall Street and in the railroad industry. But Tilden really made a name for himself fighting the most powerful political machine in the country, New York's Tammany Hall, and its infamous leader, Boss Tweed. Now, to give you a little background information, all this was going on during what would later be called the Gilded Age. Now, the Gilded Age took its name from a book of the same name written by Mark Twain in 1873. It wasn't one of his most famous works, but it it encapsulated a lot of what was going on at the time. The title referred to the process of gilding, which is when you coat something with a thin layer of gold leaf. It was seen as something excessive or wasteful, and many people felt that waste and excess defined what we call the Gilded Age. Now, it was an era of great change in America. The nation was industrializing, railroads and factories were rapidly being built, and people were getting absurdly rich. These people, who we now call robber barons, were hoarding ridiculous amounts of wealth. If you adjust a lot of those numbers for inflation, you start getting into hundreds of billions of dollars being owned by just one person. And these guys were turning their companies into massive trusts so that they could monopolize entire industries. The country's GDP rose to unprecedented heights, and these robber barons were reaping the rewards. Now, this prosperity led to a dramatic increase in the number of jobs, and this, along with the influx of immigrants, swelled the populations of the cities. All of this had major implications for American politics. You started seeing political bosses popping up across the country, running party machines that dominated city politics. Now, this system wasn't necessarily new. Andrew Jackson in 1829 had ushered in the spoil system where parties rewarded their supporters with government jobs. But in the newfound wealth of the Gilded Age, that meant that this system was now on steroids. Party bosses left and right bought off politicians and election officials and rewarded their friends with lucrative jobs and government contracts. These payoffs were often used to keep open shady businesses like prostitution and gambling houses. Now, I remember one time chatting with a Filipino friend about Philippine politics. I'm Filipino myself. And we talked about how bad the corruption was in our birth country. He said that when it came to corruption in the Philippines, the sky's the limit. Well, this was probably the best way to describe American politics at this time. Of course, corruption exists everywhere, so it's really a matter of degree. Well, in the Gilded Age, America was flush with cash, and there didn't exist the methods of documentation that we have today. With modern technology, with devices that record our every move today, it's a lot tougher to get away with something shady. That wasn't the case during the Gilded Age. Fraud, graft, cronyism was rampant. You get the sense that American politics in this time was like the Wild West. And if there was one man who exemplified the corruption of the age, it was William M. Tweed known to history as Boss Tweed. Now, Tweed was a Democrat who had served in the U.S. House and New York State Senate. 
but his real power came from running the infamous Tammany Hall political machine. It was said that Tweet throughout his career stole anywhere from one to four billion in today's dollars from the citizens of New York City. And when I read about Tweed, I found historians describing his empire as nothing short of breathtaking. To give you a little taste of what Tweed could do, when the New York County Courthouse was built under his reign, the cost exploded to $13 million, or $178 million in today's dollars. Tweed's friends reaped ludicrous amounts of money in the process. This included a carpenter who was paid $360,000, or $4.9 million today for one month's laborer, and a plasterer who got $133,000 or $1.8 million for one day's work. $1.8 million for one day. Now, I say all that to say that it was Samuel Tilden who played a critical role in taking down the most infamous party boss in America. At first, Tilden, as a Democrat, was friendly with Tweed, but when he got a better taste of the corruption at Tammany Hall, he broke with him. Tilden went through Tweed's financial statements with a fine-tooth comb and uncovered undeniable proof of bribery and graft. All the while, Tilden rebuffed bribes himself and fought to elect officials opposed to Tweed. Eventually, Tweed was arrested, found guilty on 204 counts, and imprisoned. Now, Tilden's role in Tweed's spectacular downfall made him a national symbol for government reform. And you have to remember, in a time when the nation was sick of corruption, Tilden was the perfect candidate for high office. He was elected governor of New York in 1874, and the Democrats made the smart choice and nominated him for president in 1876. When he won the nomination, Tilden spoke for millions of Americans when he said, quote, in the public administration everywhere are abuses, peculations, frauds, and corruption, till we are almost becoming ashamed of the institutions of our country, and instead of holding them up as examples for the imitation of the oppressed people of other countries, we are confessing them as a scandal in the eyes of mankind. The government no longer exists for the people, the people exist for the government." Unquote. As I read about Tilden, I got the impression that he was a man of brilliance and integrity, someone who got satisfaction from a job well done, but who didn't care much for recognition. But also someone who was a bit aloof, someone who others really didn't get to know very well. And he was a man who poured himself in his work. Although he was one of New York State's most eligible bachelors, he remained a bachelor for his entire life, singularly focused on his career. So by the end of June 1876, two governors, one from Ohio and one from New York, were vying for the presidency of the United States, and neither could imagine the torturous path that awaited them. The 1876 election was destined to be ugly. The political atmosphere was tense. The nation was divided over racial lines and regional interests, and pervading all of this was the stench of corruption. Now, to win a majority in the Electoral College, the Democratic Party had to expand its support beyond its southern states. By nominating a reformer in Tilden, Democrats hoped to appeal to Northerners sick of the Grant-era scandals. The Republicans, on the other hand, were saddled with all of this. But there was one thing it held on to, one card that it would play over and over, and that card was the bloody shirt. The bloody shirt referred to a supposed incident, which never actually happened, when a radical Republican in Congress named Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts gave a speech on the House floor while holding up a shirt stained with blood. That blood supposedly belonged to a carpetbagger who was badly beaten by members of the KKK. While the speech did happen, Butler never actually waved a bloody shirt, but the phrase stuck, and it referred to Republicans who brought up the Civil War over and over as an emotional appeal to win votes. At a time when Republican rule was at a low point, the party resorted to waving the bloody shirt again and again. Listen to what one prominent Republican, Robert Ingersoll, said in a campaign speech supporting Hayes, quote, I am opposed to the Democratic Party, and I will tell you why. Every state that seceded from the United States was a Democratic state. Every ordinance of secession that was drawn was drawn by a Democrat. 
Every man that endeavored to tear the old flag from the heaven that it enriches was a Democrat. Every man that tried to destroy this nation was a Democrat. Every man that shot Union soldiers was a Democrat. Every man that denied Union prisoners even the worm-eaten crust of famine. Every man that loved slavery better than liberty was a Democrat. The man that assassinated Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat. Every man that wanted the privilege of whipping another man to make him work for him for nothing and pay him with the lashes on his naked back was a Democrat. Every man that raised bloodhounds to pursue human beings was a Democrat. Every man that clutched from shrieking, shuddering, crouching mothers, babes from their breasts, and sold them into slavery was a Democrat. Soldiers, every scar you have on your heroic bodies was given to you by a Democrat. Every scar, every arm that is lacking, every limb that is gone is a souvenir of a Democrat. I want you to recollect it, unquote. It's hard to imagine a better example of waving the bloody shirt. Meanwhile, violence broke out as blacks tried to carve a place for themselves in the South. One example was a city called Hamburg in South Carolina. And in these situations, you would often find conflicting reports about who started what. Sometimes it would involve a black police officer and a white mob. Other times it would involve white officers and black mobs. Sometimes it was a little both. Confrontations would start. Someone would take a swing or fire their gun. And before you knew it, the authorities had a riot on its hands. Blacks were obviously the biggest victims in this time period. But in these individual situations, things usually devolved into he said, she said situations. In either way, both parties, including the Republicans, would use whatever happened to their advantage. Democrats charged Republicans with instigating the violence to justify continued military occupation of the South. And it wasn't an altogether unfair charge. It isn't a stretch to think that the Republicans wanted to break the power of the Democrats in the South. And if that was accomplished by military rule, so be it. And if you were a Republican who wanted what was best for African Americans, you may have been okay with this. But on the other side it is a fact that many Democrats were hostile to black Americans and wanted nothing less than their complete subjugation. Of course, this wasn't always the case, but it was usually the case. And there were also some Southern Republicans and Northern Democrats that complicate the picture. Either way, you can see the outlines of the strategy both sides used in the ugly election of 1876. The Republicans waved the bloody shirt, and the Democrats pinned all the corruption on the Republicans. And while Hayes seemed to genuinely care about the plight of African Americans in the South, he had no problem with his surrogates like Ingersoll spewing forth his venom. So earlier, I described the political landscape in the Gilded Age as the Wild West. But there was another landscape that could also be described the same way, the press. Now currently in 2017, I don't know a single person that likes the media. Pretty much everyone seems to believe that the mainstream media is either biased against their side, incompetent, or both. Heck, friends of mine that work in the media and are actually part of the media hate the media. So I know that criticizing the press is old news. But after reading about the 1870s, I have to say that our ancestors have us beat when it comes to outright dishonesty in the media. In the Gilded Age, Journalists routinely published hearsay and outright lies as facts in newspapers across the country, and they knew full well the impact that this would have on readers. And in a time when information wasn't as readily available as it is now, when checking your facts wasn't as easy, misinformation, or, to use a modern term, fake news, could play a major role in deciding a close election. And it happened in this election. The New York Times, which, believe it or not, was a rapidly pro-Republican paper at the time, published an utterly bogus story that Tilden had committed tax fraud. And when the story came out, other Republican papers throughout the country just ran with it. Anyone that knew Tilden knew that the story was ridiculous, and Tilden eventually published a highly detailed summary of his income, which debunked the accusation. But many felt that Tilden was too slow to respond, and that the damage had been done. And since it was a tight election, it's very possible that it played a role in the results. While all of this was going on, both candidates worked to cultivate an image of remaining above the fray, leaving the mudslinging to the papers and their surrogates. Hayes publicly announced that if elected, he would only serve one term and not stand for re-election, potentially an olive branch to the Democrats. <laughs> 
But while Hayes and Tilden were posing as statements, things were very different on the ground. In his book Fraud of the Century, Roy Morris highlights just some of the dirty tactics used in the election. And there's a long list. There were so many that I couldn't fit them all into this podcast episode. But here are a few. In Florida, Democrat landowners and merchants threatened black sharecroppers that a vote for Hayes would ruin their credit ratings. In other parts of Florida, local landlords, shopkeepers, doctors, and lawyers threatened those suspected of voting Republican with a 25% surtax, while state-run railroads threatened to fire any employees that attended Democratic rallies. Even worse, the specter of violence continued to threaten the election. Near Lake City, Florida, an armed group of white men confronted a smaller group of blacks and placed nooses around their necks. Although they released the black men, they did so only after making them promise to leave the Republican Party. And here's one of my favorite stories. In the Florida State Capitol, former Confederate Colonel Robert Gamble led a group of Democrats to meet Republican Governor Marcellus Stearns and bluntly told him, quote, We have come, sir, to put you on notice that if a single white man is killed in Leon County on Election Day, there are 300 of us who have sworn that your life shall pay for it, unquote. You have to admire the honesty and the courtesy of letting him know their plans ahead of time. In mid-September in Ellentown, South Carolina, violence broke out when two black men were arrested for robbing and beating up a white woman. A shootout ensued that left 17 men, black and white, dead. The fighting ended only after military forces arrived to restore order. And just a few days before the election, a black man named Henry Pinkston was brutally murdered in cold blood in his home in Louisiana. While the culprit was never identified, Republicans pointed the finger at local Democrats, while Democrats blamed another black man. These are just a few examples of the violence that marred the election, violence that was part of a broader trend during Reconstruction. The violence reached the point to which President Grant, in October, decided to send thousands of troops into South Carolina to maintain order. Regardless of who started these incidents, Democrats used them to intimidate black and Republican voters, while Republicans kept waving the bloody shirt. In a time when the media pretty much wrote whatever they wanted, when fake news was the rule rather than the exception, it didn't seem to matter what the truth was. And if it wasn't violence, fraud ran rampant, and neither side had the moral high ground. In Louisiana, the Republicans, through a great deal of trickery, were somehow able to disqualify about 8,000 Democrats from the voter rolls. This incident, amusingly, would be known as the sewing machine swindle. In the midst of all of this chaos, I'm reminded of the 2000 election and just how crazy all of that turned out. Remember the dimpled and hanging chads? Remember how the media kept making the wrong calls? It seems that in 2000, both sides really had a ton of reasons to feel screwed and claim that their side had won. You see, when you put the microscope on our elections, you start to see just how chaotic they are and how far both sides are willing to go to win. Well, in 1876, things were worse. I don't remember the same level of violence, if any violence at all, occurred in the 2000 election. In 1876, things were nasty. And I think that with fraud and violence breaking out and each side blaming the other, it's tough to argue that anyone had the moral high ground or was the true winner. At any rate, in these situations, little things that few notice initially can come to have a big impact later on. And one of these things happened on August 1st, 1876. On that date, the state of Colorado was admitted into the Union. Now, the Democrats had the majority in the House, And they had the choice of admitting Colorado into the Union before or after the election, but they chose to do so before. They did so because Colorado's sole congressional delegate, a Democrat named Thomas Patterson, assured them that the state would cast its three electoral votes for Tilden. Well, Colorado's legislature decided early who they would vote for, and to Mr. Patterson's chagrin, they chose Hayes. And as we will see, this was one of a few critical mistakes that would determine the outcome of the election. Now, as Election Day neared, both Hayes and Tilden felt that the Democrats had a slight edge. Hayes was told that he could count on 144 electoral votes. Tilden was told he could count on 181 votes, tantalizingly close to the 185 votes he needed to win. Millions of Americans, including Hayes, believed that Tilden was nearing victory, 
On November 1st, Hayes wrote in his diary, quote, The contest is close and yet doubtful, with the chances, as I see them, rather against us, unquote. Election Day came on Tuesday, November 7th, 1876. On that day, about 8.5 million Americans went to the polls. Hayes spent a quiet day to himself in Columbus. Those who saw Hayes that day said he seemed indifferent to the prospect of defeat. Tilden was in New York City in the Democratic headquarters and greeted supporters who believed that they were in the presence of the next president. That evening, news spread that Tilden had carried several northern swing states in New York City. With that, both men went to bed believing that Samuel J. Tilden had been elected the 19th president of the United States. Remember what I said earlier about fake news? Well, over the next couple of days, the newspapers reported to the American people a mess of contradictory headlines. Democrat-leaning papers, like the New York Tribune, triumphantly proclaimed Tilden's election and the end of Grantism. Republican-leaning papers like the Chicago Tribune reported that Tilden had won thanks to, quote, Democratic greed and plunder, while another GOP-leaning paper, the New York Herald, claimed that the result was too close to call. Although the New York Times initially reported the same thing, by the next day, it claimed that Hayes had won. It was difficult to find a paper that distinguished between what was true and what they hoped was true. When the dust had settled, it appeared that Tilden had secured 17 states and 184 electoral votes, while Hayes had 18 states and 166 electoral votes. Tilden was one vote shy of the 185 electoral votes needed to claim the presidency. Three states remained too close to call, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Tilden led the popular vote by over a quarter of a million votes, three percentage points more than Hayes, and had received about 700,000 votes more than Grant did four years earlier. Still, he couldn't claim to be president-elect just yet. The math showed that he had to win just one more state to secure the presidency. Meanwhile, Hayes' chance of winning rested on the unlikely prospect of winning all three. Despite uncertainty in those three states, Hayes remained sure of his defeat. To reporters, he said, quote, I think we are defeated. I am of the opinion that the Democrats have carried the country and elected Tilden, unquote. Hayes then expressed concern less for himself and more for what a Democratic victory would mean for others. Quote, I don't care for myself. The party... Yes, the country, too, can stand it, but I do care for the poor colored men of the South, unquote. Hayes feared that the white Southerners, quote, will practically treat the constitutional amendments as nullities, and then the colored man's fate will be worse than when he was in slavery, with a humane master to look after his interests. Now, while Hayes was moving on with his life, Republicans at party headquarters in New York City weren't so sure that things were over. On election night, when it was clear that Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina were too close to call, Republican official Daniel Sickles sent a telegram to the governors of those states that read, quote, With your state sure for Hayes, he is elected. Hold your state. Since the three states were still under federal occupation, all three governors were conveniently Republicans. The National Republican chairman, Zachariah Chandler, was defiant. Rumors were spreading that the governors of Florida and Louisiana believed Tilden won their states. Even the most prominent Republican, President Grant, believed that Tilden had won. Ignoring all of this, Chandler proclaimed that Hayes had won the three states and thus the presidency. Meanwhile, on the other side, Democratic officials urged Tilden to take action to secure his claim to the presidency. The National Democratic Party chair, a man named Abram Hewitt, drafted a statement for Tilden to give, calling on the American people to stand vigilant and report any fraud that they knew about. But Tilden, to the Democrats' consternation, refused to release the statement. Another Democrat official recommended that Tilden meet with Hayes and arrange for a bipartisan group of citizens to travel to the South to oversee the count, but again Tilden refused. With the presidency at stake, Democrats across the country started getting frustrated 
at Tilden's seeming indifference, but Hayes, too, projected a sense of calm. He told his supporters to, quote, be satisfied with the reflection that the people are too patriotic, too intelligent, too self-poised to allow anything perilous to be done that may disturb or destroy our peculiar form of government. Don't be alarmed. It seemed as if everyone cared except the candidates themselves. As Republicans began to press their case, Democrats, sure that Tilden had won, began to worry that they would be robbed of what they felt was certain victory. So you start seeing tempers flaring. Rumors began swirling that the Democrats were plotting an armed takeover of Washington. One rumor even had General George McClellan, the Democrats' 1964 nominee, forcibly installing Tilden at the White House. So you really had the sense that the country was unsettled. It kind of reminds me of the period right after Election Day in 2000 when the country was just stuck in this heated stalemate. Now, America's political universe began to zero in on those three uncertain southern states. Both parties started sending top officials to each state to oversee the count. In Louisiana, Tilden had a seemingly safe lead of about 7,000 votes. But in Florida, Tilden had a minuscule 91-vote lead out of about 45,000 votes. And trickery and deceit threatened to change that. In fact, the day after the election, a train carrying ballots to the Florida state capitol derailed. The Republican governor claimed that the KKK had sabotaged the train in an effort to aid the Democrats. Who knows? When the count began, both parties immediately claimed fraud and violence. Now, Tilden only needed to win one of these three states to claim the presidency, but the Republicans had a critical trump card in their favor. The state board's in all three states, which would determine the results of the elections, were controlled by, yes, Republicans. And, as we saw earlier, the governors of each state were Republicans. And not only that, but the board members were, yes, unabashedly corrupt. Apparently, Louisiana's board was the worst of the three, and even had a history of overturning elections. And yet, these corrupt boards would help decide who the country's next president would be and they had less than a month to do so, since the members of the Electoral College were meeting in state capitals across the country on December 6th to cast their votes. While the nation focused on the three southern states, Democrats looked elsewhere. They eyed an opportunity to deny Hayes the presidency, even if he won those remaining three states. Now, Hayes had narrowly won the state of Oregon by less than about a 1,000 votes, and therefore he had won its three electoral votes. But one of Hayes' electors was a man named John Watts, and he held a position as a postmaster. He was a government employee. Now, the Constitution barred federal employees like Watts from serving as an elector, but Watts knew this ahead of time, and so he resigned his position just before the election, and he was assuming that Hayes, after his election, would reward Watts by reinstating him back as postmaster. When this happened, the Democrats cried foul and urged Oregon's governor, Lafayette Grover, to appoint the elector who had the next highest number of votes, a man named Eugene Cronin. Cronin also happened to be a Democrat pledged to Tilden. Now, the Democrats had a legitimate point here, but they had tricks up their own sleeve. A shadowy political operator named Colonel William Pelton began soliciting bribes to ensure Cronin's designation as an elector. Grover ended up removing Watts as an elector and installing Cronin. Oh, by the way, did I mention that Colonel Pelton was Tilden's nephew? Yes, Sam Tilden's own nephew tried to bribe people to get his uncle an extra elector in Oregon. Now, historians seem to accept that Tilden was unaware of what was going on, and I like to side with Tilden on this, but nonetheless, the dirty tricks were going on on both sides. Now it was the Republicans who were crying foul in Oregon. Meanwhile, the Louisiana board convened first on November 17th. Tilden's 7,000 vote lead seemed secure. Remember when I said that the boards were corrupt? Well, seven of the clerks involved in the counting were real winners. They were either currently or had previously been under indictment. So predictably, both parties flooded the board with accusations of fraud during the board's proceedings. But unfortunately for the Democrat, the board decided to ignore most of their complaints. When the board concluded their work, 
They invalidated about 15,000 votes, a lopsided 13,000 of which were for Tilden. So in doing so, the board awarded Louisiana to Hayes. And just like that, a handful of men overturned the results of an entire state to the Republicans. The South Carolina board convened next, and, surprise surprise, by late November, it too was awarded to Hayes. So turning to Florida, Tilden's 91-vote lead didn't stand a chance. When the state board convened, it too heavily favored Republican fraud claims, despite the fact that some GOP officials clearly solicited bribes. The Florida board worked feverishly up to the very night before the Electoral College members were due to cast their votes on December 6th. When the results were in, Hayes had won the state by 924 votes. All three boards ruled in favor of Hayes. As you can imagine, Democrats were outraged at the results. The Republican governor signed certificates, declaring Hayes the winner of their states. But Democrats weren't going to take this lying down, so Democrat officials in each state drafted their own certificates, claiming Tilden had won. In the midst of all of this, one Republican who went to Florida to oversee the county expressed what many probably felt about what was going on. In a letter to his wife, Lou Wallace, a retired general and veteran of the Civil War, wrote, quote, I scarcely ever passed a week under such depression of spirits. It is terrible to see the extent to which all classes go in their determination to win. Conscience offers no restraint. Nothing is so common as the resort to perjury, unless it is violence. In short, I do not know who to believe. If we win, our methods are subject to impeachment for possible fraud. If the enemy wins, it is the same thing exactly. Doubt, suspicion, irritation go with the consequence, whatever it may be. On a random and interesting note, Lou Wallace was also the author of the famous 1880 book, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. So on December 6, 1876, the Electoral College cast their votes throughout the nation's state capitals. At the end of the day, Tilden had 184 electoral votes, still shy of the one vote he needed to win. Hayes had 165 votes, having lost that one elector from Oregon. Missing in the count were the votes from Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and that one vote from Oregon. Both the Democrats and the Republicans had sent in competing certificates for all four contested states, and both parties claimed victory. The United States still did not know who its next president would be, and even worse, few could agree on what to do next. So the next big deadline was February 1st, 1877. That was the day that the House and Senate were scheduled to meet in joint session to count the electoral votes and declare the winner of the election. Back then, presidents were inaugurated in March, not in January as they are today. Now, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution stated that, quote, the President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. Now, the President of the Senate is normally the Vice President of the United States, but Grant's Vice President, Henry Wilson, had died in 1875, leaving the position vacant. So the acting President of the Senate was a Republican named Thomas Ferry, and it fell to him to preside over the count. But notice how ambiguous the wording was in the 12th Amendment. It said that the President of the Senate opens the certificates and that the votes shall be counted. It did not specify exactly who would count them or whether the person counting them could decide between the disputed certificates. This ambiguity had major implications for the outcome. The Republicans interpreted the clause to mean that Ferry not only counted but also adjudicated the votes. Of course, they had every reason to argue this, since Ferry was a Republican, and they assumed he would rule favorably for Hayes. The Democrats, on the other hand, argued that Ferry could only open the certificates and announce the results, but that he had no authority to adjudicate the votes. The Democrats hoped that since neither candidate received the necessary majority, the election for president would then be decided by the House of Representatives, as specified by the Constitution. The House just happened to have a Democrat majority which presumably would elect Tilden. The vice presidential election would go to the Senate, where the Republicans had a majority. But this was totally acceptable to the Democrats if it meant a Tilden victory in the House. And just to mix it up, 
Others felt that the Supreme Court should decide the winner. So both parties dug in their heels, and as you can imagine, neither side was willing to cave. They couldn't agree not only on who had won, but also on how to figure that out. Thankfully, someone in the Congress knew that something had to be done. The nation needed to have a president by March 4th. So the day after the vote was counted on December 7th, Republican Congressman George McCrary from Iowa proposed a bill that would create a special bipartisan committee to come up with a solution that everyone would agree on. You might remember the super committee in 2012 that was supposed to come up with a budget deal. Well, this was similar, except it had to figure out how to resolve the election. Now, by January 1877, this committee, now the Joint Committee on the Electoral Count, proposed a special electoral commission to decide the fate of the contested states. Both parties, for the first time since the election, agreed, and President Grant signed the commission into existence by the end of the month. Now, this was really a novel idea. The commission would consist of 15 members five congressmen, five senators, and five Supreme Court justices. Of the 15 members, seven would be Republicans and seven would be Democrats. I'd give their names, but most of them are relatively forgotten. One of them was a Republican congressman named James Garfield, who had his own date with presidential destiny just a few years later. Anyways, on the commission would be seven Republicans and seven Democrats, but one seat remained, and that seat would go to an independent. And the most independent member of the Supreme Court was Associate Justice David Davis, so he was chosen to serve as the 15th member. No commission like this had ever been created, and none like it has been created since. This was completely outside the procedure specified in the Constitution. So, for the first and only time in American history, the laws on the books weren't sufficient to determine the winner of the presidency, and Congress basically had to make up new rules to find a solution. The men of the commission would be acting with virtually no precedent to guide them. Now, Tilden was not happy with this solution. He agreed with the rest of the Democrats that the election should go to the House, and quite frankly, I can't blame him. And he continued to frustrate his supporters by remaining aloof to the proceedings. And because he was a huge nerd, more of a nerd than a politician, he spent most of his time working, of all things, on a book about the history of presidential election law. Meanwhile, Hayes wasn't happy with the creation of the commission either. He hoped that Ferry would count the votes, assuming that the fellow Republican would rule in his favor. But unlike Tilden, Hayes and his men wisely began working behind the scenes. They began reaching out to Southern Democrats. Now, it isn't clear what was promised, but Democrats started getting the impression that a Hayes administration might give the South the autonomy they craved. And so Hayes had an edge on Tilden in this this post-election day contest. So the Electoral Commission's job was to convene once a dispute arose during the counting of the electoral votes and determine who won the disputed state's votes. It became clear that the seven Democrats and the seven Republicans on the commission were likely to vote on party lines, so that made the one independent, David Davis, the deciding vote. Now, Davis is a pretty interesting guy. He was an old friend of President Abraham Lincoln's and had actually run Lincoln's successful campaign for the nomination in 1860. He played a key role in the election of one president, and it looked like he would play an even more important role in the election of another. If you look at his Wikipedia entry, which, by the way, is not my usual source, it says that he was almost the only person in American history to be in the position to single-handedly select the President of the United States. Historians speculate that not even Davis knew who he supported. If he did, we don't know. The scales were evenly balanced with Davis in the hot seat. But just as Davis was set to make this decision, a group of Democrats in the Illinois state legislature committed a fatal error, probably the biggest mistake of the entire election. Just before February 1st, they elected Davis to one of the state's two U.S. Senate seats. Now, the Illinois Democrats thought that in doing so, they had ensured his support for Tilden. When word had reached Republicans, they cried foul and accused the Democrats of a corrupt bargain. In order to avoid the appearance of impropriety, Davis resigned his seat on the commission. 
Some historians speculate he didn't want to have the burden of choosing the next president on his record and alienate one half of the entire country. And if that's the case, who could blame him? The Supreme Court justices were tasked with replacing Davis with another member from within their ranks. They ended up choosing Justice Joseph P. Bradley. Now, while Bradley was probably the next most independent of the justices, he was a Republican, having been appointed by Grant in 1870. So instead of David Davis casting the deciding vote, this task fell to Joseph Bradley. On February 1st, the Senate gathered in the House chamber to formally count the votes. When they reached Florida, they opened the two conflicting certificates. Objections were immediately raised, so Ferry referred them to the Electoral Commission. The commissioners convened in the old Senate chamber to hear arguments from both sides. From there, Pro Hay's lawyers argued that the state's board had a right to determine the results of the election. In response, Pro Tilden lawyers argued that the commission could investigate and throw out the board's results. Hay's lawyers countered that there simply wasn't enough time for an investigation. They hoped to run out the clock. The arguments lasted for days. But before long, a decision was reached. On February 7, 1877, Justice Bradley stood and read his opinion. He argued that Congress could not investigate the board's results. Those present knew what this meant. Florida would go to Hayes. And they also knew that this same logic would be extended to the other states, and that meant that Hayes, who seemed dead in the water, now had the advantage. Now, in the wake of this decision, several claims have been made that Bradley was somehow influenced in his decision. The story goes that Democrats visited Bradley at his home the night before he announced his decision. During the visit, Bradley showed them an opinion he had written in favor of Tilden. Because of this, the Democrats left certain that Tilden would prevail. Then, after the Democrats had left, two Republicans, Senator Frederick Frelinghuysen and Secretary of the Navy George Robeson, supposedly visited Bradley and convinced him not to surrender the White House to the Democrats. Some say that Bradley's own wife joined them in lobbying for the Republicans, convincing him to rule for Hayes. Bradley denied having any visitors that night. These claims are intriguing, but we will never really know whether they're true. Like other events, they come down to one person's word against the other. Whether or not these mysterious rendezvous occurred and changed the course of American history is forever left to speculation. The commission reported its Florida decision to Congress. The House, led by the Democrats, rejected it, but the Senate, led by Republicans, accepted it. According to the Electoral Commission Act, the commission's decisions could be rendered invalid only if both chambers of Congress rejected it, so the decision stood. Democrats were enraged and claimed that eight of the commissioners had validated a fraudulent result and usurped the will of the American people. But this wasn't the only shady moment during the Florida count. During the original count, Ferry received three competing certificates, two of which were signed by Florida Governor William Kellogg. One of those certificates came in without all of the elector's signatures, rendering it invalid. However, Ferry secretly and inappropriately had the certificate sent back to Florida, where the signatures were forged and returned. When the certificate returned, the state was counted for Hayes. With Florida decided, the electoral count resumed in the Senate. The same thing happened when Louisiana was called. The Electoral Commission gave it to Hayes. When they reached Oregon, two conflicting certificates again were presented, one with all three votes for Hayes and the other with two votes for Hayes and one for Tilden. If the latter certificate were counted, Tilden would win. Again, this was referred to the commission, and again the commission agreed with the Republicans and awarded them to Hayes. The Democrats were desperate. They began considering alternative ways to block Hayes' election. They started mulling over a filibuster to round out the clock on the Electoral Commission's mandate. Meanwhile, talks ensued between both parties. Sensing the inevitable, the Democrats were more willing to bargain to get something out of a losing cause. They signaled that they could acquiesce to Hayes' victory in exchange for the withdrawal of federal troops from the South. One particular meeting was held at the Wormley Hotel in Washington. Some historians say that this meeting truly sealed the deal, but others say it was just a rubber stamp on the inevitable. 
In fact, Hayes himself claimed later to have not felt particularly bound by these talks. Whatever happened at that meeting, on February 26th, South Carolina's disputed votes were submitted to the commission. Two days later, the commission voted 8-7 to seven to award them to Hayes. All four disputed states went to Hayes. He was on his way to 185 electoral votes. So by now, we are at the end of February. Remember, Inauguration Day was March 4th, so Congress was burning the midnight oil. Four days remain until Inauguration Day, and the Democrats hadn't given up. Officially, there was still no president-elect. In those final days, tensions were high on Capitol Hill. Many Democrats felt that they were in the process of being robbed and were brooding over the prospect of a fifth straight defeat in a presidential election. Patience was wearing thin. Congressmen even brought pistols to work, and some fistfights even broke out. The nation held its breath. The specter of violence loomed overhead. In fact, weeks earlier, when Hayes was having dinner with his family in Columbus, a bullet actually pierced a window at his home. Thankfully, no one was injured. The wait seemed endless. The Democrats continued pushing last-ditch delaying tactics when the Vermont and Wisconsin certificates were opened. To the great annoyance of several Republicans, this forced the Congress to wait overnight and they continued to threaten a filibuster past Inauguration Day. Some braced for the extraordinary possibility of the nation not having a president when the new term started. But up in New York, Samuel Tilden had enough and decided to put an end to all of it. He telegrammed the Democrats to end their tactics and finish the vote. Republicans breathed a sigh of relief. With that, the Democrats knew it was over. There would be no filibuster, no more delays. At 10 past 4 a.m. on Friday, March 2, 1877, the final state was counted. The final tally read 185 electoral votes for Hayes and 184 votes for Tilden. Less than two days before Inauguration Day, Congress officially announced Rutherford B. Hayes as the 19th President of the United States. Poor Hayes and Wheeler too, poor Hayes and Wheeler too, we'll cast our vote for the boys in blue and Hayes and Wheeler too. On March 4th, 1877, Hayes took the oath of office. Since that day fell on a Sunday, the first swearing-in took place in secret, and the public ceremony would take place the following day. He sounded a conciliatory note in his inaugural address, quote, Looking for the guidance of that divine hand upon which the destinies of nations and individuals are shaped, I call upon you, senators, representatives, judges, fellow citizens, here and everywhere, to unite with me in an earnest effort to secure to our country the blessings, not only of material prosperity, but of justice, peace, and union. A union depending not upon the constraint of force, but upon the loving devotion of a free people. And yet to millions of Americans, Hayes remained an illegitimate president. Democrats across the country called him a cheat, nicknaming him Ruther Fraud and his fraudulency. As president, Hayes eventually withdrew federal troops from the remaining southern states under occupation. To millions of African Americans, these forces were all that stood between them and and the oppressive hand of white Southerners. Though the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, blacks across the country felt betrayed. Jim Crow had already begun, but as Reconstruction ended, discrimination and segregation would be unleashed at full force, setting off over a century of second-class status for African Americans. For many, 1876 was the beginning of one of the darkest episodes in American history. Historians continue to debate just how decisive a role the election of 1876 played in all of this. Recent scholarship tends to see the end of Reconstruction as part of a broader trend that was more or less inevitable regardless of the outcome of the election. Hayes had hoped that despite the withdrawal, black suffrage would continue, but by the end of 1878, he admitted his policy was a failure. As it turned out, Rutherford Hayes was a relatively popular president. This was, in part, because the scandals which had plagued the Grant era had ended. Keeping true to his word, Hayes didn't seek re-election in 1880, 
In that year, once again, the Republicans won a close race, this time with former Electoral Commissioner James Garfield on the ticket. Since then, historians have rated Hayes as a relatively inconsequential president, a passive actor in a time when the nation preferred passivity in its leaders. The irony of Hayes is that a relatively honorable man ascended to the highest office in the land after one of the most dishonorable elections in its history. Samuel Tilden remained aloof to the last. Shortly after his election, Tilden famously said, I can retire to private life with the consciousness that I shall receive from posterity the credit of having been elected to the highest position in the gift of the people without any of the cares and responsibilities of the office. A remarkable series of events conspired to deny Tilden the highest office in the land. But for Colorado's admission into the Union, but for Illinois state legislature's boneheaded decision to elect David Davis to the Senate, Samuel Tilden may have taken office in 1877. With that said, with fraud running rampant on both sides, with corrupt state boards overturning elections, with fake news being printed across the country, perhaps no one could truly claim to have been legitimately elected that year. Although he was mentioned as a candidate in the 1880 election, Tilden by then was in his mid-60s and declined to run. And after a lifetime of combat in politics, who could blame him? If he felt any bitterness about the election, he never expressed it. As Roy Morris notes in his book, Tilden spoke publicly at an event three months after his defeat. Although he believed he was the true winner, he took the high road, saying, quote, If my voice could reach throughout the country and be heard in the remotest hamlet, I would say, Be of good cheer. The Republic will live. The institutions of our fathers are not to expire in shame. The sovereignty of the people shall be rescued from this peril and be reestablished. Now, the election of 1876 was, in many ways, what the founders feared the most. As I said earlier, they feared what would happen if the republic would become too democratic. They feared the rise of professional politicians who would build fiefdoms to serve their selfish interests. They feared government positions becoming lucrative rewards for political loyalty and they feared that public servants would be compromised by bribery or blackmail. And by 1876, all of these elements were out in full force. Few elections in American history featured as much outright corruption as the election of 1876. It was an ugly time, a time when the country was severely divided along racial, regional, and political lines, a time when party bosses and politicians broke laws with seeming impunity, these scenes reveal some of the worst of America. And yet, at the same time, the election of 1876 revealed so much of what makes America unique. In the 19th century, autocracy reigned all throughout the world. Most governments were just as, if not more, corrupt. And one nation came at an impasse while selecting its leader. The world's sole large-scale republic found itself facing a seemingly endless stalemate. But ultimately it came to a resolution. The entire process was ugly, and at times of questionable legality. But in the end, power passed along peacefully from one person to another, and the losing side, for the most part, accepted the result. The country, though divided, moved on to bigger and better things. In time, the nation would pass civil service reform and institute primaries to reduce the power of corrupt bosses and it was only beginning to assert itself as a world power. Deep divisions remain in our country today, and human nature hasn't changed. There will always be someone out there willing to break the law to win an election, and our elections are still nasty as ever. But through all the rancor and chaos, our country continues to persist as it did in 1876 and continue its path to form a more perfect union, and this, in large part, is because our founders built a system that could withstand the worst excesses of democracy. If you want to learn more about today's episode, check out the book Fraud of the Century by Roy Morris Jr. or By One Vote by Michael Holt. This American President is produced by myself, Richard Lim, and Michael Neal with creative consulting from Emily O'Connor. 
Special thanks to my dad, Bert Chu, who created our website. Find us on the web at thisamericanpresident.com for show notes about this and all future episodes. Follow us on Twitter at this A M E R P R E S for updates. Also, please review us on iTunes to help us promote the podcast. Now, we've done our first two episodes on individual presidents, on George Washington and Andrew Johnson. And so some of you might ask why do an episode on election, specifically why the election of 1876? Well, the first thing is that it is a time that is often ignored. People like to learn about the Civil War. They like to learn about the Progressive Era. So this one brief period in American history called the Gilded Age, I think, has a lot of lessons to teach us, and yet it's something that few people are truly familiar with. And it also involves a president that is really forgotten, Rutherford Hayes. What can most people say about him? And yet, the story is so remarkable because it's really a singular moment in American history. It's really the first time that the Constitution itself was actually inadequate to settle a presidential election. Congress actually had to make new laws. They actually had to change the rules after the election to figure out the results of the election. That didn't happen in 2000 as far as I know, or in other disputed or close elections. And the other reason is that I'm just fascinated by elections. I mean, you you think about just how suspenseful they are, how exciting they are. I remember the 2000 election and just wondering as it dragged on and on, it was so close. And I, I always wondered, what is it like to be one of those candidates? You know, when I, sometimes when I watch the Super Bowl or you know, the NBA Finals or the World Series, I think, what is it like to be one of those guys where your entire career is on the line? Well, during these elections, I I think the same thing. What was it like to be George W. Bush or Al Gore when the election was too close to call and the networks kept calling it for Bush and then Gore and then Bush? And this election, 1876, was the closest election in history if you look at the electoral count. It was a one-vote difference that chose the president. And so, to me, it's as exciting as a, a sports game, uh, a championship. And the other reason was because there are just so many themes in 1876 that resonate today. You have racial, regional, ideological divisions throughout the country. You have violence breaking out at rallies. You have newspapers that are printing completely false stories. And you have people that have lost faith in their government because they see it as corrupt. They see it as hopelessly irredeemable. Uh, And after the 2016 election and what you're seeing today is that people are feeling like the country's future is hopeless. They're feeling that the country is going off the rails. And when you look at 1876, a lot of people felt the same way. They felt that we were such a corrupt country that uh, that was the rule and that virtue was the exception. And yet the country after 1876 would rise and become the most powerful country in the world and it would become the leader of the free world and it would play a critical role in expanding liberty throughout the world and it would improve itself and improve the lot of minorities within the country and I think what that shows us is that despite our problems, whether it's in 1876 or in 2016, there are strengths that underlie that, strengths that underlie the system that are inherent to our republic, got us through 1876 and will get us through today. I'm Richard Lim. We're back next time with more This American President.